one good test is worth a thousand expert opinions. You could say we got a thousand expert opinions on the Orion launch abort system on July 2nd. Next on the Rocket Ranch. Program Chief Engineer, verify no constraints to launch. Three, two, one, and lift off. Welcome to space. We are coming through the second incredibly successful test of the Orion launch abort system that happened last month, and we had a chance to sit down with Carlos Garcia, the lead for that launch abort system. But first, we caught up with a bit of a test flight expert, John Coward, to learn more about test flights in general. All right, so I am now in the booth with John Cowart. John, thanks for joining me. Glad to be here. This is this is fun. So if you could tell me just really briefly, what is it that you do here in the, the commercial crew program for NASA? Well, in the commercial crew, uh, I work in the mission management and integration office. We're charged with basically each mission has a mission manager. And that mission manager is responsible for all aspects of getting that flight ready to go fly, working with the ISS, working with whatever partner we have for that flight, and, and all the things that we within NASA have to do to get ready for that. So I used to be a mission manager and then I got made deputy manager of the entire office, which means I help all the managers do all the tasks that they've got to do across all the flights and all the providers. Cool. So I think actually the first time I ever heard you speak, yeah. you were doing a debrief after the Ares 1X flight. Um, and we'll never forget that because you had some humorous things to say about that, <laughs> um, which I, I mention only to say that you have some good experience with test flights. Yes. So the Ares 1X, for those that don't know, 2009, I believe. That was it. Um, we, we launched the Ares 1X, which mm -hmm. was a test flight. And then 2015, we had the paddleboard test. That was paddleboard, right. SpaceX. Exactly. And you were involved with both of those. So yes. tell me a little bit about your experience and involvement and kind of just l launch tests in general. There's a, there's a famous quote by Werner von Braun that, that kind of outlines exactly what flight tests are about. And it's, it's something along the lines of, one good test is worth a thousand expert opinions. We, within NASA, what we try to do is we, we try to design it as best we can. You, you have an idea what you need, you go uh, design it, and then you go do a little bit of testing. Um, that philosophy pays huge dividends. You can, you can think you've designed it great all day long until you go test. And so whenever we do these flight tests, we learn so very much. And, and, and what people have a hard time believing is that, that when you go do a test and something goes, what y'all would think is, is awfully wrong, that's sure. actually good for us that we found it in a flight test or some kind of a test rather than with people on board or when the mission is critical. So while it, it looks bad and, and we never go into a test thinking we're going to fail, obviously you go in uh, not just optimistic, but pretty darn sure things are going to be successful. Um, when you find out that you didn't, you, you learn more from your mistakes than you ever learned from your successes. And so when you go into a test like that, what's the how do you build that? And obviously being a mission manager, you have some experience with this kind of, yeah. how do you kind of construct, like what do we want to accomplish with a test? So anytime you have a, a flight test, you have a set of flight test objectives in which you go through and you you clearly outline, okay, if when I get to this point in the countdown, I want to do this. When I get to this point in the flight, I want to do these things. And you talk about them very clearly. You, For example, I'll just make one up. If, uh, if I'm in flight and I want my environmental control system to keep the cabin between uh, 65 degrees and 80 degrees, I'm going to test it. I'm going to point it at different ways towards the sun and see how the system responds and, and and if it keeps the temperature within the bounds of where we think it should be. If it doesn't, we go, okay, well, something there's something going on that we didn't account for. And if you do, you go, all right, we did a good design. Fantastic. So temperature inside the capsule obviously is important, but that seems like trivial in a way. Is that a trivial thing to kind of analyze with a spacecraft? No, because uh, in the environment of space, uh, one thing I tell people all the time is if you are out walking in space, even in Earth orbit, and you hold your hand up, the side of your hand that is facing the sun is very quickly going to get to 250 degrees. The side of your hand that is not facing the sun that's in shadow will very quickly get to minus 150 degrees. That feels uncomfortable, I'm assuming. That would be very <laughs> uncomfortable. So just controlling temperature is not a simple thing. You, you insulate it as best you can. You put reflectors on the outside, some kind of material that reflects the sun. But then when you're in the shadow of the Earth, well, now you've got to find heat from somewhere to help keep the cabin warm. So that you may think that's a trivial example but and and maybe it, it would seem that way to someone who's worried about the pressures and temperatures and thrust of a rocket engine which is sure. a very dynamic event um, but but it's equally important to the crew i can assure you of that so can you give me some 
perspective on the number of things that you might test on a flight. And obviously, I know it's going to change pretty heavily from what you're testing. Right. Um, but again, in my mind, if I were building requirements, like temperature inside the capsule is not one that comes to mind quickly. Okay. And that re- raises the question, like, <laughs> how many things am I not thinking about? <laughs> thousands and thousands of things. Uh, you've got to look at your, your guidance, your navigation, uh, your ability to control the thrust in every one of your thrusters, depending on which vehicle you're flying. You've got different numbers of thrusters. Are you going to bother to test a, a, some kind of an optical alignment system? Uh, how well did that perform? If you do, uh, you've got to worry about the, the thermals on the outside, thermals on the inside. Um, you structure, you look at, did, did the vehicle flex the way I thought it would? Now comes reentry time. I've got a heat shield on the bottom. Will that perform? How much of that is going to erode away? Will any of it erode away? What's the aerodynamics of the vehicle as I fly up through the atmosphere and then coming back through the atmosphere? Like I said, and so each one of those things I just mentioned right there breaks down into hundreds of other little things that you test very specifically in various locations. For example, with the structure, you don't just put a, a, a strain gauge at one point. You put it all over the vehicle in various places to find out how the vehicle flexes uh, you're checking pressures and temperatures and, and thermal stuff all over. And so based on kind of that just real brief explanation, it almost starts feeling like you would treat a test flight like it's an entire own complete mission. Is that a fair way to kind of assess that? In, yes. In, in many ways, it might be more important because you're, you're trying to set the table for a nominal mission. During a, a flight test, you might not, you're not going to try to operate out of what we call certification. You're not, if, if you've got a box that's designed be, to operate between, let's say, 50 and 100 degrees, you're not going to do anything to verify that it operates between 30 and 150. But you, you don't mind testing as you get near the edges of its performance envelope. And by the way, one of the things I forgot to mention previously, is, so we're talking about hardware things, and, and but there's also software things. You're yeah. going to test the software. Mm-hmm. And then there's also the people aspect of it. Did I plan on all the things that the astronauts could do? Oh, what about the folks on the ground, the mission controllers and the flight controllers and the launch controllers, those people? They have to be trained. They're certified as well as the vehicle and the software. All these things have to be tested in a flight test. And, and I know it, when I've done flight tests before, the first time you get all the people uh, on the loop talking about a test, they're saying that's like, hey, Joe, did you see that? Well, that's not very professional. It doesn't communicate very well. <laughs> You've got to learn to say you know, things like, uh, pad leader, uh, step 23, did you get 75? you got to be very specific. And, and, and your responses and your callback, those can be very important to you if something bad were to go wrong. And you got to go back and play the tapes and figure out, okay, what, what was everybody thinking? What was, the, what was going on at that particular time? And the voice loops and the data you're getting on your screens are all just as important as what's going on on the vehicle. And so as a, as a manager of a mission, planning a mission, you just kind of alluded to this. You have to have a procedure and, and kind of a guideline for how to do everything. So what kind of time is involved in just writing a procedure and making sure that your procedure makes sense? Oh, it's, uh, of course, you know, we're all engineers and we know the more planning you do up front, the better you will do when you actually get to the event. And, 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 and this, this plays out into everything else, I think. I, what was it, Muhammad Ali said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> well, that, in particular, when things go bad, you want to have some kind of a plan. And and, and in that sense, he's probably correct in that, uh, okay, now things have gone really south. I didn't plan on things going this particular direction, perhaps, but because I've done the thinking that, that planned for similar contingencies, I have a better idea of what to expect. So, these procedures that we were even on a nominal mission, literally for every hour you spend in orbit, you've put thousands of hours into mm-hmm. planning what to do uh, during that time. It, we're very, very thorough, and, and you have to be because space is very unforgiving of inattention to detail. So you mentioned this idea of of space being unforgiving. Does that kind of impact the way we do testing? Because I know that some testing obviously involves atmosphere and flight through atmosphere or right. returning into atmosphere right. and some of it's in space. So I struggle with the question because it's, yeah. it's just like, how do you, like, how do you do that? Let's like, I don't want to lose the reality of like, this is rocket science and it's really difficult. Right. Which, it, which has become almost kind of a trite statement, but, but it's not to us because we know how difficult it is. And, and like you're suggesting, uh, we've got to look at all of these things. And so it is a mountain of work to get over. Um, I, I alluded to it before where if a box is designed to operate, let's say, between 50 and 100 degrees, when we certify that box for use in spaceflight, and particularly human spaceflight, I will certify that it can operate between 30 and 150. 
when I qualify that box, I will test it between 30 and 150. And from then on, my flight plan should always keep it between 50 and 100. These are all just examples so people can, can easily understand. So that's how you certify something. You qualify to a greater number so that it, you, you can have some error in what you're doing, and then you try to operate within normal bounds. That way, if you occasionally deviate outside of that, you know, hey, the box will still work, whatever, whatever it's got to go do. So it's, space is tough because, like I said, it's, it's unforgiving, and so we have to think very carefully about everything, the, the way we design. I mean, even when we're designing something, we go through something called a PDR, preliminary design review. That's where you're about 10% of the way into the design. You say, okay, I kind of think this is where I'm heading. Everybody sit down, look at this. What do you think? Are, are we designing in the right direction? You design a lot more. You get to about what you would call the 90% of what we call a critical design review. At this point, you might have actually made some test hardware and tested a couple of things you weren't sure were going to operate. But at CDR, you're essentially saying, okay, once we leave this meeting, we're going to go build this box. That, uh, that I have designed that, that's 90% and, and maybe like 10% left there, but we're going to go start building this for flight and go, and we're going to go build a test model first and go test it. And then once we've gotten to CDR and we've built a test model, we'll go test it. If it works out fine, that's the box we're going to go build. And that's the box we're going to go fly. And as we kind of look at the history of NASA with test flights ranging for more than, for about 60 years now. Right. Um, do we do we find a lot of these things like CDR and PDR you mentioned? Right. Do those, are those legacy products? Are we, do we have a guidance of how to do test flights well, or are we kind of trying to reinvent it a little bit every time? We, uh, so we're trying to be smart. It is the 21st century. And what we did back in the 50s and 60s might need a little updating. The, the, the kind of the process is with the CDR and the PDR, we continue to do that sort of thing. But but with the modern tools we have available available, and, and, and the computers that, that can do, I mean, you know, the whole, we went to uh, the moon practically uh, with slide rules. And, and we, we, we've got... <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. So we're way beyond that now. So we're trying to be smart. And, uh, and I would say, uh, particularly in the commercial crew program, Boeing and SpaceX are both trying to, to drag us in some ways into the 21st century and use more modern tools. Uh, but we still do, uh, mentally, we still follow that. PDR and CDR process, um, SpaceX in, in particular seems to prefer to do less um, design work up front and go build something real quick. And because like I said, one good test is worth a thousand analyses. Right. They tend to be more of a design test, design test, design test, whereas traditionally NASA has been kind of a design, 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 design test. One big test. We, we put all our eggs in one big basket. They've got a slightly different philosophy. And that, that's closer to what our Russian colleagues do, what, what their philosophy is. So there's more than one way to go skin this cat. And we're trying to be, we're trying to find the smartest way at all times. Yeah, so obviously, NASA, we are on a path to the moon, um, hopefully here in 2024. Well, I hope so. Yes. Yeah, um, and we have a lot of test flights coming up, preparing mm -hmm. for that, getting ready, and on our way. So, right. John, appreciate your expertise. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. I, I think people should hear this and know uh, that this is a tough business, but we love doing it. That path to the moon leads through the Orion spacecraft. Here's Carlos Garcia with more. So, the title is fairly self-explanatory, I think, launch abort system. This is a system that we use to abort a launch. Is that a fair way to describe it? Yes, that's correct. Um, in addition to abort a launch, we also have uh, ascent abort. So, in, um, not to get to be specific yet, but we have the capability to uh, provide ascent abort roughly, uh, you know, course after launch, uh, up until about two and a half minutes after the uh, solid rocket boosters separate from the launch vehicle. Can you just give me a quick rundown kind of of the process from start to finish of what is involved in utilizing the launch abort system? So imagine the crew ingresses the, the crew module um, and the uh, crew access arm is retracted. So at that point, the launch abort system is armed. Um, and if there is an anomaly detected on the pad, the Launch Control Center will obviously uh, be concerned about the crew and initiate a uh, pad abort with the uh, Launch Control System. Uh, their boat motor will fire um, and propel the uh, crew module away from any harm, and the bulk of that thrust occurs within three seconds. It burns to an additional two more seconds. At the same time, the attitude control motor 
We are ran to the crew module to allow for the jettison of the launch abort system, which will allow the uh, crew module to deploy its parachutes and land uh, safely in the ocean. At that time, the rescue uh, crew will be on its way to, uh, to arrive and safely egress the crew from the crew module. Where, where are we talking about landing taking place? Uh, and can you kind of compare and contrast if we do the pad abort versus an ascent abort? I'm assuming we're going into the Atlantic Ocean regardless. Yes, we'll be going to the Atlantic Ocean uh, during uh, the most of the abort phase. Um, I, again, I don't have the specific details on how many nautical miles out, you know, in that trajectory. But, yes, we'll be in the Atlantic Ocean. And obviously, depending upon when in flight you would abort, you're going to be in a different spot anyway. That's correct. Let's, again, assume we kind of had a bad day. We ended up with astronauts in the ocean in a, in a capsule. Mm-hmm. Um, they're alive. How do we get them out of the water, and how fast can we do that? Um, let's see. So we have, uh, we've been working very closely with our, uh, our partners uh, here at uh, uh, Patrick Air Force Base and those recovery assets. Um, you know, we've been training uh, various times. They have, uh, and I don't recall all the details of the simulators that were used, but uh, they have to, uh, they know exactly where the crew module is. We have Lat Long, of course, we have a Locator Beacon and so forth. So we have pre-deployed assets through the whole um, path of that flight trajectory. And um, I, I know, I, I forget the actual time limit, but I believe they have to be there within you know, several hours. Okay. So it's, it's not an instantaneous kind of thing, but they'll be there pretty quick. That's correct. To kind of get to the crew and get them safe. And they obviously train for all this as well about yes. how to deal with that if they end up in the water, oh, yes. what to do, how to be safe, those kinds of things. Yes. I mean, we have to put handholds in certain areas on the crew module so the, the flight and rescue crew can, can actually get there, you know, and help open up the hatch and, and get our astronauts out. So once they get there, so it's a couple hours later, a few hours later, they get to the capsule. Are, are the astronauts trained to be outside the capsule as soon as possible? Are they supposed to wait inside the capsule? What's kind of that process They're like? supposed to wait inside the capsule. Okay. Right, in, until uh, help arrives, yes. Okay, and then the crews that come in obviously are trained on how to get in, pull them out. That's correct. And to safety. Great. So there's, there's part of me that thinks that this sounds like a really fun ride, uh, a high-speed <laughs> ride. Is, is that a... <laughs> is that a, you, you you chuckle and so your response kind of makes me think that maybe this isn't like your typical amusement park thrill ride probably times 10 <laughs> um, which, which is a good thing or a bad thing because I feel like at some point it gets dangerous I'm, I'm guessing well, we're not in that range yet. no it's it's not dangerous it's it's that's why we have our amazing astronauts that can sustain this kind of loads and um, their the abort motor essentially can produce up to uh, 11 G's a force, you know, on the body, which is not insignificant. So, but they do have <laughs> pressurized suits, of course. Yes. Okay, so it's a it's a pretty wild ride for yes. them. Yes. Uh, but obviously, the goal here being a rough ride, maybe, but you live. Correct. Correct. Is the launch abort system for Orion particularly sof- sophisticated? Obviously, we know that we're building it now, so it's it is current in technology. But is there something that sets it apart from commercial launch abort systems or past commercial or past launch abort systems? Well, the systems um, are essentially a heritage technology. Solid rocket motors have been around for some time. Um, we do have uh, advanced avionics, uh, you know, with the, the computers, of course. In addition to, uh, we have composite materials on the fairing, what we call the ogives, and that essentially, you know, makes the uh, the shroud of the launch abort system as light as possible. What's an ogive? That's what we call the uh, the actual fairing that goes around the crew module for the launch abort system. Is there a story behind that, or is that just a, a shortening of its name? I, I've never questioned it. Sorry. <laughs> and that, my friend, is, is indicative of some NASA things. Yes. We don't ever question, or we don't necessarily question. We just kind of use them and know what they mean. <laughs> and w- what's a shroud? A shroud, essentially, is the, um, uh, the pr- protective uh, area around the crew module. Um, to protect the the crew and the uh, actual crew module from aerodynamic loads. For people that are on the ground and maybe if this unfortunately were to happen someday, Mm -hmm. what is this, what's a spectator going to see? What's this visually like? So um, obviously with all the cameras, you know, prior to launch, the spectators would definitely see a pad abort. I mean, they may not notice some anomaly on the pad, um, but, uh, you know, they'll just like, wow, what, what happened? You can see the actual, you know, crew module with the launch abort system take off. 
Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, you know, the abort motor would propel it over the ocean and then jettison, and then the crew module would deploy its parachutes and land, you know, in the ocean to be uh, recovered from the, our flight and rescue team at Bad Patrick. So something that you'd notice, but not necessarily the same kind of visual impact as a launch. Of course. Um, now, obviously, you know, if it's a pad abort, we would uh, definitely be able to see, you know, all the details about that. If it occurs during ascent, as we talked uh, for an ascent abort, um, that altitude is can be greater than 24,000 feet. So, you know, from uh, uh, the layman's eye, you won't necessarily see a, an ascent abort, you know, obviously very clearly. Just because it's so high and it's traveling downrange so far. That's correct. Gotcha. Cool. So what's the likelihood of needing to use this? Obviously, like, it's super important because we're dealing with safety of humans, and so we want it, but what's the likelihood that we will ever use this system? It's it's highly unlikely, you know, and I don't have numbers I can share with you. Uh, I'm sure we do have some, but I just don't have those in front of me. It's extremely unlikely. Um, I, I do recall from uh, the Russian rocket, they did have to use their pad abort system sometime, but I think it only uh, was used once, but it did save the crew. Awesome. So, you know, again, it's, it's something you definitely never want to use, but if you need it, it's there. Believe it or not, shortly after we interviewed Carlos, a Russian Soyuz launch headed to the space station was aborted successfully, pulling the capsule and two crew members to safety. And how does, how does the, the call, so to speak, take place to use this? You mentioned a minute ago about a team kind of deciding that. Mm -hmm. Is this a human decision or are there computers involved here to help make this decision? Well, there's, there's three instances, you know, of course, so uh, the, the Orion has our, uh, abort software in that, you know, monitors uh, its situational awareness as well as, as, well as the launch vehicle. Um, so in most cases, because this has to occur extremely fast, uh, Orion itself will initiate an abort if needed. Um, if we're in flight, then Mission Control in Houston will initiate an abort, or uh, during launch, uh, the launch control system can initiate an abort, as well as if for some reason the crew needs to do it, they have that ability as well. Okay, so just piquing my curiosity there. So obviously if Orion, the, the software, is essentially making that choice, then mm -hmm. it's an automatic thing. Correct. Is there is there a button that somebody has to push that does this? Is that is it a physical button or what is it? Well, it, normally it's a fire and arm, so it's more than okay. just one button. Yeah. <laughs> so not just like a head shoe, like yes. whoops. But it's, it's a, you got to do a couple things, but Correct. it is a physical yes. toggle of some nature that you have if to do. If it's a manual input, yes. Okay. Yes. All right, cool. Let me just mention this. So... We kind of touched on it, but um, the launch abort system, you know, can be automatically initiated uh, by the Orion software. We talked about that, or initiated manually through um, several different paths, and that's either through the crew or the launch control center or mission control center. Again, uh, during flight, um, so the Orion monitors its health and status during the whole time. It also has input from uh, the launch vehicle and it's looking for several uh, abort conditions from the launch vehicle and obviously if some of those conditions are met it's going to receive a command to go ahead and initiate a, an abort. And what's the window to be able to use this because you talked about having the crew on board mm -hmm. and having armed the system so how much window are we talking about because not knowing how the processing will go for SLS I know that for shuttle we had hours where we had a crew on board and we weren't flying yet. So is that, are we looking at a similar timeline where that could be a possibility? It's a possibility, uh, but nominally, um, you know, we don't want to have the crew in there any longer than we have to. Um, so, you know, you imagine the crew getting in the, the actual Orion crew module, you know, they have to walk through the, the access arm, get situated, get strapped in. Uh, once that is, uh, you know, um, essentially behind us, we remove the crew access arm. This uh, launch abort system is then armed, and uh, any time after, you know, the crew access arm has has actually been retracted, and the crew is inside the uh, the the crew module, they have the the capability for a pad abort, and that can be you know five minutes before launch, or if there is a delay, you know, that can be you know hours for weather or what have you. Sure. And again. Um, so we have pad abort, of course, on the pad, and then ascent abort up to about two and a half minutes in flight. 
just after a okay. solid rocket booster separation from the launch gotcha. vehicle. After two and a half minutes, what what's kind of the situation at that point? Are we at a point where we're much safer, or? Well, yes, we're much safer because if you if we, well, um, you know the the roughest ride is uh, structurally is with the solid rocket boosters on the the launch vehicle. Once we have those separated, yes, the ride is much smoother. Um, but then we have to uh, jettison the launch abort system because it's no longer needed. But there are other uh, abort modes for Orion if needed. But uh, essentially, that's just you know the Orion capsule separating and then you know, either landing in the ocean or, or or whatever abort to orbit or those other abort modes that are that are needed. Gotcha. So there's other systems in place beyond that two and a half minute time. That's line. correct. Cool. So the Orion monitors its health and status during the whole time. It also has input from uh, the launch vehicle and it's looking for several uh, abort conditions from the launch vehicle and obviously if some of those conditions are met it's going to receive a command to go ahead and initiate a, uh, an abort. Can you give me a, a few examples like what are those kinds of what kinds of things? Obviously that's a, probably a long list but what are some of the, the things that would trigger that? If, if for some reason um, the the trajectory is off its nominal path right um, therefore, you know, hey, we have unsafe condition. Sure. Uh, we're not, you know, we're reaching some, some uh, aerodynamic loads that exceed what the vehicle have been designed for, and, and therefore it would uh, initiate an, uh, an automatic abort. And on the ground, what, what kinds of things would the system be looking for as well? Those would be mostly, mostly uh, um, launch pad conditions. Um, you know, if for some reason there's a fire on the pad or an anomaly with the launch vehicle during loading, a leak in the fire with the launch vehicle, then yeah, then uh, the launch okay. control system will initiate a, an abort, a pad abort. So, Carlos, you're working on a system that is designed to save people's lives in the event of an emergency. I'm guessing there's some sort of really great feeling that comes with that. Do you kind of process that day to day? Um, yes and no. I mean, uh, not necessarily. Uh, the bulk of our time is essentially trying to build, you know, the launch abort system, you know, in a timely manner to support our schedules. Um, but in the back of our minds, we do know how important this particular piece of hardware is. There's a great team, you know, in Houston as well as uh, the Langley Research Center that have been working on this for some time. We have proven this with our pad abort test uh, back in, I believe it was 2010. So, um, you know, we try not to, to, you know, worry about everything that can go wrong, but ensure ourselves, you know, when, when days go right. The launch abort system is essentially, you know, insurance um, for the Orion capsule, but more importantly, the crew. Um, as all things, uh, we hope never to have to use our launch abort system, but the event, in the event that we do have Unfortunately, a bad day, either on the pad or during ascent, uh, we are very confident that our launch support system will safely remove the crew from harm, and we can recover them and rescue them safely. All right, so Carlos, I appreciate you being here today. Uh, big thank you to you and your entire team for the work you're doing and for making spaceflight that much safer for the future. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. The completion of the three and a half minute Ascent Abort 2 test saw the Orion mock-up travel six miles in altitude before the abort motor successfully pulled the capsule away from the modified Peacekeeper, definitively proving that we can outrun a speeding rocket. Every test and every day that goes by, we take another small step towards the moon and Mars. I'm Joshua Santora, and that's our show. Thanks for stopping by the Rocket Ranch. And special thanks to our guests, John Cowart and Carlos Garcia. To learn more about Orion, visit nasa.gov slash Orion. And to learn more about everything going on at the Kennedy Space Center, go to nasa.gov slash Kennedy. Check out NASA's other podcasts to learn more about what's happening at all of our centers at nasa.gov slash podcasts. A special shout out to our producer, John Sackman, our soundman, Lauren Maythree, editor, Michelle Stone, and special thanks to Brittany Thorpe and Stephanie Martin. And remember, on the Rocket Ranch, even the sky isn't the limit.